Um, which this mic, this mic, left. Okay, this one, great. Hello. So I've never been to EMF. I thought maybe there'll be like 20 people in a tent. This is so many people. Hello. Um, so. Uh, if this goes a bit too fast or a bit too detailed, then we put all the notes on a, um, a page that we'll share at the end. So I run a studio called Geeks for Social Change, which I started in about 2015. This kind of came out of a desire to blend together kind of activism, technology, and research. Um, so sort of by actually working within community groups to make things better. At my heart, I'm kind of more of a scrappy activist than anything else. Um, I'm kind of really embedded in sort of feminist, trans, abolitionist, anti-racist politics. And I just couldn't see myself represented anywhere in tech. Um, and a lot of the existing stuff out there just fell really wide of the mark for me. Um, so as I'll get onto in this talk, I was also just really burnt out from doing this activism and wanted to do something joyful and fun and to be able to deliver projects um, with a sort of very fully automated luxury queer communism vibe, which is kind of, you can probably tell from my cardigan. <laughs> Um, so to get away from the coal face, a lot of activism can get at where you get really burnt out and sort of actually start building this wor world we keep talking that we want to live in. So this talk's going to go through how we've been doing, um, the work we've got planned, and like maybe how you can take part if you want to talk to us. So part one is about making, uh, just making as the basis for experiencing joy. So I imagine almost everyone here uses making, coding, producing, sewing, sculpting, or whatever your creative output is as a form of coping, right? So the world sucks, but I can make a nice thing and it kind of gives my life value. It feels like we, we can't change the world, or it's, um, but we can make some cool doodads. And this process kind of is therapeutic, it keeps us mindful, lets us use our hands work in non-hierarchical ways, and generally, you know, mess around and find out with sort of low stakes. I think this is really, really deep <laughs> and something that doesn't get enough attention and at the core of often what gives our lives meaning and what we center our identities around. However, we're not really living in a society that allows this joy to be at the forefront of our lives and it's often something we have to fit into the cracks. So I've got a long quote here. Oh, hang on, my, t my notes just went off. So let me get this up. So this Deleuze quote, which I read out. So we live in a world which is generally disagreeable, where not only people, but established powers have a stake in transmitting sad affects to us. Sadness, sad affects are all those which reduce our power to act. The established powers need our sadness to make us slaves. And this kind of goes on, but the gist of this is, it's like there's this force of the world which is preventing us from doing things which make us happy, essentially. So Deleuze here talks about desire of production as the basis for our being. And this is an additive process that drives us, be it everything from sort of like the desire to go for a wee, to eat a burger, to play with your phone, to like design a shader on stage or, or build something out of scaffolding or turn mercury into gold or all the other things we've seen this weekend. So like this kind of comes on to this doing stuff as an escape from the drudgery. Um, a lot of the effort that's needed to begin and maintain these things is really something that needs attention. So many people, I think, have got jobs they hate or think are kind of useless and do this stuff in the weekends and the gaps to feel valued. Um, David Graeber pointed out that the more you get paid, like the less likely your job is to have value to society. And he's written a whole book about it called Bullshit Jobs that's very good and I recommend it. <laughs> so we learn all these skills and then often the daytime application seems boring and we do this stuff in the evening. Um, so like making is literally our escape from oppressive power structures. Um, so you know, um, these are the things that we don't necessarily have to jump through hoops to do so. They exist in this space where we can do our niche interests with our friends that bring us joy, and we can do it actually like collaboratively and collectively. So I would say like joy in this context doesn't mean the joy you get from sort of like going to a party, getting drunk, taking drugs, whatever you want to do. I think I'm talking here about the satisfaction of like setting your mind to a really hard problem or a really hard challenge and then fixing it or for some value of fixing it. You know, I think this stuff makes you feel alive and it gives you a feeling of agency and like you, you can do something. And I think this is more a kind of like months and years, not days and weeks feeling generally. Doing good projects, 
can be one of the, the most rewarding things. And I think anyone who's been part of a big event or a group or a festival probably feels this, and that's probably in large part why people are here today to share what they've been working on. It can form part of your identity and it literally changes how you think about the world and how you interact with it. So to summarize, doing and making stuff is not just fun, but possibly like a really basic form of interacting with the universe. So like capitalism is kind of bad and gets in the way of this. And yeah, if you think you, it sounds like I'm describing communism, you're probably right. Um, I should look into that. <laughs> so the difficulty then comes when you want to do it with other people. And this is where it gets hard because like people are messy and relationships are messy and the world we live in is messy. So this might be sort of taking your personal practice and instead of doing it by yourself, setting up a hack space, forming a Dungeons and Dragons group um, or a knitting circle, going LARPing, making a Minecraft server, maybe even just a weekly meetup at the pub. Um, it could also be trying to mobilize some friends to go to a protest, form a mutual aid group or, a, or a, like a trans clothes swap like a zine fair or putting on sort of a vaguely political film festival or organizing a club night for a minoritized group. You know, the, the, the gap here between political and non-political is very blurred. You know, the personal is political. Um, so there's no real clear distinction here, although there's kind of obviously a spectrum. So while the core of these activities is very different, the actual activity um, becomes the same. You're, you're building relationships and literally like community organizing for whatever value of community you're working with. Um, again, these relationships can be the ones that give our lives meaning. These are our friends, our family, the people we work with, the people we feel comfortable with, the people we're not sort of like obliged to hang out with like we are with, you know, sort of like colleagues or government or other people. It's important to note that like we're not really taught how to work cooperatively at any point in our educational work systems. People are very used to being in these rigid structures and they have a boss they moan about and underlings that they do whatever they want. So despite the fact it's more or less the default way of doing hobby groups, we don't really learn about doing consensus, conflict resolution, restorative justice, or a bunch of other things that would really help. So this kind of organizing stuff with other people can get really tricky just because we're kind of missing this human relationship toolkit. So it's this relationship work that's kind of now where I'm gonna start focusing on. So um, this is a, a kind of key concept we've used in our work a lot, the difference between communities of place and communities of interest. So we all exist within both, and they kind of, they're worth like thinking about a little bit. So a community of place is basically just where we live. It's our immediate neighborhood, the things we walk past every day. So I think this used to be the main space, which would be what you would consider like community life, like, um, it's sometimes, you know, someone asks you where you live, you don't say the city, you say like your ward or your town. But so now this can feel very alienating, I think especially to people who live in, 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 in cities. I live in a really mixed inner city area, um, which is Hume in Manchester, if anyone knows it. And it's kind of enormously divided by age. There's a student population that keeps itself to itself. The older people live in a lot of these like cul-de-sacs with their own community centers and they kind of don't mix. I mean, the university has literally erected these gigantic fences to keep them in too, so it doesn't really help. But you kind of end up with like, you've got, you know, on the ground, people can live near each other in ways that are kind of invisible, even though it seems like we live in the same place. So like, this is still somewhat self-selecting. Like where you live at birth is still probably the single biggest predictor of your life chances. But in the rarefied world we live in, this is probably a lot more like the finger quotes real world than the sort of self-selecting -sele hobby groups we end up with kind of online or again, over a larger area, um, you can end up sort of working in this sort of sub, sub, subset of a city. So communities of interest are kind of exactly what they sound like. Um, I think this is what, why most people are here, they'll be in a hack space group or a friendship group around an interest. Um, I think the rise of the internet has made these far easier to do um, and they've sort of shoved out communities of place to some extent. The interplay between these can be really hard, and I think this is why it can feel so hard to get stuff done right now. Um, we're sort of in this new era where such a large proportion of the internet is like very online in ways that are controlled by gigantic companies who directly set what behaviors are accessible or like discoverable. This is both kind of increased alienation between people who are on and offline, but also kind of like within these communities, so online communities you know, 
famously tends to, <laughs> you get into scene drama very quickly. So on some level, we're working on a crossover between the two. The size of the geography expands as the size of our interest gets more niche. So for example, if I think about trans organizing, this makes no sense on a ward level, which is about you know 10,000-ish people. Because as a group that's about 0.3 to 0.5% of the population, we need to cast a wider net. But on the flip side, if I'm thinking about protecting a local park or meeting neighbors for coffee, I'm thinking, you know, a couple hundred meters from my house. And also, like, everyone else is going to have their own place they go for coffee and their own local park. So you're not expecting that to be of interest outside of where you are. Um, but, you know, these things silo fast, so interest groups, then, you know, it ends up being kind of like death metal genres where you're kind of like, oh, no, we hate them, they hate us. And this scene drama can kind of take over. Um, so I think this sort of like real thinking about returning to communities of place and trying to leave our comfort zone of communities of interest is kind of an important thing. And then I just say, doing it under the Tories sucks. Um, <laughs> I hope this isn't very controversial for this audience but it's extremely disempowering. Um, it feels like talking about possibility and change whilst it's, we're struggling to exist. So that, you know, we've kind of got this intersecting cost of living crisis, the ongoing pandemic, the corrupt and often fascist government. There's a social isolation and loneliness crisis, an upswing in structural racism and hate crime, and kind of highly coordinated and well-funded attacks on trans people that are creating an incredibly intolerant environment for making any kind of change happen. I think COVID especially has torn apart a lot of the normal functionings of how student groups especially integrate with local communities that we're still sort of coming to understand. Just give me some water. I think a lot of us, especially who are perhaps if you're like two or more of kind of trans, disabled, person of color, neurodivergent, working class, queer, carers, I'm not all of these to be clear, and other marginalized groups have sort of never been further from kind of political representation. Um, the party sucks, the alternative to that party sucks, the alternative to that party sucks. And at some point, we're kind of all the way over here, and I think um, we've then got this billionaire press that only allows certain stuff to come through, and whatever the hell is going on with social media right now. So, a lot of us not only see no representation of ourselves at all, we, uh, maybe through our community of interest, and that's it, which is another thing that tethers it to it. We've kind of, um, these sort of daily attacks on our kind of ability to exist. So to be clear, I do really respect people who are trying to make change in these systems. I'm just finding increasingly, I'm giving up, my friends are giving up, the networks I'm giving up with. And we're trying to come back to this sense of like, what can we do on the ground to make joy happen in our immediate communities? Um, I'd say too that injecting these sort of big P politics into our work unfolds in really confusing and complex ways. Honestly, there's something really cringe feeling about talking about any politics, which I think is maybe why I'm so nervous. I feel like everyone I talk to who does anything related to activism or community organizing, they hate all the terms, all the terminology, the culture, and all of it. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm very much working on being cringe and being free. Feels good. Um, I think a lot of this stems from the fact that people think of activism as being like going to a protest or kind of being obnoxious on Twitter. And for many people, that is the front door, or at least has been historically. But I think we simply have to find better ways of being more able to resist this state of affairs that are kind of inherently joyful, sustainable, inclusive, can pay people a wage to do so can censor the needs of structurally marginalized people and take us back, excuse me, to what matters all about this, which is kind of enabling this sense of collective joy from which I think springs all resistance effectively. There's a real, talking about injecting politics into everyday life, there's a real um, issue here. So I was in, we were invited here to do this talk under this kind of equality, diversity, and inclusion banner. And I think it's just worth saying, like, you know, the festival isn't very diverse, realizes it, is trying to fix it, which I think a lot of organizations are doing right now, which is great. There's a lot of structural reasons why this is the case that are a bit too personal to get into, but I think, and the idea of it being someone's fault isn't necessarily helpful, but I think it's good to look at the structural issues behind this. So this study kind of blew my mind when I read it, which said that men have five hours more leisure time a week than women. So like, this is a whole hobby. <laughs> 
I mean, how many things do we spend five hours a week doing? And like, you know, there's the side of all this free labor, of this um, finger quotes free labor that is radically classed and gendered. I don't, they've not done this study based on other demographic factors. I only have this number and I'd love to know more. Um, but I think just thinking about the freedom of having leisure time and having so much of it and people having different quantities of it is something that really needs like some consideration. Um, whoops. Oh, I've lost my place again. <laughs> Be right with you. Okay. So, and I think the problem that we get into here comes because, because there's such this unequal distribution of free time, what we do in that time tends to represent it and kind of comes around this sort of accidentally quite sort of normal normative kind of, Grayson Perry calls it like the default man, you know, who has the free time to do this and everyone else needs kind of an extra affordance to be part of this. So in the context of disability studies, um, I've got this quote from Joss Boys. if it's, did we put that on a slide? Oop, has the thing stopped? Oops, sorry, there we go. This is kind of a long quote, <laughs> um, so, but I think it's important to read out. So, why does the idea of disability being creative and avant-garde seem so absurd? Is it because of the taken for granted assumptions about disabled people that they are in need of the help of others, are passive consumers of services, constitute a minority of individuals in society who unfortunately must bear the brunt of their own medical problems? What if instead we see that rethinking disability enables us to explore critically and creatively assumptions about disability and ability, which in turn can offer better ways of understanding the implications of both bodily diversity and everyday social spatial practice. So this is from an architect who wrote this, but I think this could sort of be um, applied to most contexts we work in, right? Where it's like, if we put this idea of who are we including first, it creates different interesting challenges that are just as um, interesting to solve. So I think anyone who's tried to organize anything <laughs> will know how hard it is. Um, there's stuff you hear over and over again where like people, if you're trying to get involved in things, it can often feel like, oh, I tried to join this activist space and everyone was just yelling at each other. <laughs> Sometimes I'm doing the yelling. I think there's also the sense that people involved in this space are complete dicks, <laughs> which is true some of the time. And you get in trouble for stuff because there's a lot of other things going on in that space. and it. it um, or like the other, the other way, which is, you know, you try and help out a community center, they don't really have a volunteering program, they don't get back to you, you sort of get, you know, easily put off. And from the side of kind of trying to organize a group, it can be just as frustrating. So a really common thing is like people come to you and they just want to offer a skill for an hour and actually it doesn't quite work like that. If we had something we could fix in an hour, someone would have probably done it. So, you know, like people thinking they can fix homelessness with a poster or something is like a real thing I've seen. Or like, you know, someone says they'll make a website is a really common one and it doesn't work and they don't listen to anyone and it sort of hangs around and there's all this awkward half-life of like institutional websites that are broken. Or, the, or like they just volunteers come and promise the world and then just like vanish off the face of the earth the next day. So like I say, there's no easy fix to any of this stuff. It's just um, we're kind of dealing in this world of like unfunded stuff that's made structurally hard. <laughs> um, in centers that have, oft, that have been kind of cut and cut and cut over the years. I think a lot of this happens because as soon as you step outside of kind of, com, you know, these structures that might be oppressive, but people know their place in kind of a hierarchy, you start dealing with these actual breakdowns and they can be really jarring. So structural discrimination is really ugly, operates on multiple scales. And the dynamics have sort of existed long before you got there and will exist a long time after. Putting your toe in can feel like it's getting bitten off. It takes a lot of hard work to kind of start decolonizing ourselves and learning the kind of racist, transphobic, classist things. I'm still working on it. And it's kind of meeting people where they are and they have the power and it can be, it can be it's really disconcerting. So like, we d I don't have any answers for this, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm hoping that by sort of bringing it up, we can start to have discussions about it. But uh, I'm now gonna talk about the work that we've just started doing on community technology partnerships. So we're trying to take a lot of this good stuff, this kind of desire to make, the desire to do things, to do them with your friends, and kind of put it together in a way that overcomes these ideas more from the ground up. 
So we're still working through this. We've got some funding. We've got a couple of years to work on it. It kind of infuses all of our work anyway. So we'll, you know, we'll be in the, I'll probably go in the, the one with the picnic benches over by the main tent. If people want to come and talk about it, we'd love to find out what you're up to. Um, so on the surface of it, it seems simple. So yeah, like I'm saying, people have skills they want to use. Community groups have unmet needs. Why is this so difficult to happen? What, we what we've found is that a lot of tech methodologies are actually really unsuitable for this. So the two of the big ones are like design thinking and human-centered design. And they sort of proclaim to be liberatory, but if you read through them, it's still very much with this idea that we'll sort of helicopter someone in, put them on the ground, they'll fix a problem, we'll take them away, and we kind of have this experts and non-experts thing. It's taken quite a lot to sort of piece, to pull this apart. Where we're coming from, from this instead is this approach called the capability approach. Um, so this is kind of a human development approach that's sort of used by the UN and the, for the Sustainable Development Goals, developed by Martha Nussbaum and Amata Sen, are the two really famous names. And it asks, quite simply, what is it that people are able to do and be as a group? And then what things are getting in the way of that? What blockers are there? And how can we remove them? So rather than it sort of starting from this idea of the thing we're trying to do, like the one thing, we're sort of looking at the hundred things that might be in your way if you're trying to say set up a community group or whatever. So this can seem like a simple question, but it's actually a very concrete ethical test that represents people's fundamental existence. So rather than having choices made for them on the basis of kind of external characteristics or assumptions of their abilities that might come, you know, if you're not a part of that community, um, it, it re-centers the communities at the center of interventions. So like by basing our work on this approach rather than something that's been kind of invented by you know, someone in California, it usually is, we think we found a way to reconfi reconfigure this. So we call this community technology partnerships. We think people are the best judges of their own personal circumstances and the best place to fix it. Our approach to developing this has been these um, three stages that we've used a few times now. So step one is like direct engagement with an involvement of, which, so you've got to work directly with people in a, in a sort of place-based creative partnership. So you can have interest, but there has to be an element of place-based because that's how you keep it honest and kind of de-silo it. And then using this to um, actively enable the realization of self-defined opportunities for individuals and groups. So it's about working together to improve our collective capabilities. The explicit goal of this is, that, is to increase our power to act. So if you've ever lived somewhere where you don't think it's possible to get anything done, and then you've perhaps moved city or come to a maker camp, and all of a sudden you're awash with ideas and possibilities and creativity and meeting people, that's kind of what we want. <laughs> but like as, as like a day-to-day -day thing and not like the rarefied thing we, we get to go to a few, times, a few times a year. To illustrate this, this has been a lot of theory. <laughs> I'll give you a few examples from stuff that we've worked on with various groups in our neighborhood. So the first one is a project called I'm OK. Um, we worked with a local No Borders Manchester group who wanted to create a tool for their signing support network. So as part of the hostile environment policy, people seeking asylum have to go and sign into one of 14 like signing centers in the UK. Um, it's kind of a bit like a parole system. It's been report repeatedly described by people as like the most dehumanizing aspect of the whole asylum process. Um, there's an abolish reporting hashtag that has a lot of stuff on it and there's groups working on this. They tend to put these reporting centers in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's kind of no seating or shelter. They're kind of in industrial estates. On attending, you get asked a range of completely inane questions that just seem no one can quite understand what they're trying to get to. It seems just to annoy you. But like at these centers, the crucial danger is if they do decide to deport you, even though they're not meant to, they will, they will and have immediately detained people, driven them to the airport, and tried to extradite them on flights. So this whole process is incredibly stressful because every time you go, it's kind of like, you know, maybe there's a one in 50 chance I'm just going to get deported. So what the No Borders group have been doing was doing this manually um, by standing outside, registering people when they go in, checking they come out. Um, this was requiring a massive amount of labor on the ground. So they basically approached us and we talked about this and what we've ended up making is it's like a a little piece of bot software, it's MIT licensed, you can do what you want with it, but it, it will, uh, it sets up a telegram bot and people can just text in when they go into a session and if they don't check 
press out when they come out after 30 minutes, the Telegram group chat gets a, a notification. So the idea was we were using all the tech they were already using, kind of mobile phones, it works on SMS and Telegram. And like, um, sadly, we've not really got to test it because of the COVID, the changes in COVID, they changed how they do it, but we're working on doing a proper pilot and a, and a second release. Um, so yeah, that's our first example. <laughs> it's on our GitHub. The second example is kind of an even simpler one. You know, the last one, it was like a very big social problem and we ended up actually making quite a small, simple tool that like is designed for us not even to own in the end and we think it's got other applications. This was simply a case where when, when COVID started in my neighborhood, we've got a lot of um, sort of very deprived older population. The landlady at the community pub um, was just like, we need to do something about this. They had some family in Italy and we're seeing what was happening there. So we had a group who was willing to do deliveries, which was Acorn, a renters union. We had um, one of these schemes where they pick veg that's on the fields going off. Um, and they had the kitchen and they had the drivers and they just needed someone to basically put it all together. So this ended up literally just being an Airtable database, but it was kind of like well designed. We did a proper service design. We got to think through the problem. We made, we made a database that fit it all together. So it was probably ended up being, you know, kind of a week's worth of, maybe not even a week's worth of tech labor. And, and this is now fed, you know, delivered over 5,000 meals to people's house. The final example I'll give is um, this flagship tech we're working on that hopefully we'll come and tell you about next year called PlayScale. So this came out of a huge co-produced project that happened where I live in Hume. They wanted to examine the causes of social isolation and loneliness for the over 50s was the focus of the project. This divested, this had thousands of conversations, divested loads of money to community groups um, and found this really common thing where people thought there's just nothing to do in my neighborhood. This has really led to like social isolation up and down the country. Um, in the UK, um, there's estimated there'll be two million people who are lonely and socially isolated by 2024. And there's like long-term long longitudinal studies that show that loneliness is as bad for your health as smoking two packets of cigarettes a week, which is crazy to me. So despite these massive investments of time and money by like city councils, health providers, housing associations, into like loads of community directories, it, they just weren't working. The information wasn't getting to people. So we went to find out why. Let's have a bit more water. Um, I think I'm a little running out of time. So very broadly speaking, rather than trying to do this as a kind of one-off top-down tech intervention, we worked with all these local partnerships to get them actually working together. We built some software that basically aggregates data from like um, Google Calendar, Outlook, Facebook, Meetup, Eventbrite, whatever people were using and it kind of sorts it all and filters it all out by region. And it's got a community of interest tagging thing too. <laughs> um, I would love to go into this more and we can talk about it later, but I see I have two minutes left. And then we also designed a training program to go with it. So it was very much like this three tiered approach of like working with local strategy that's already there on the ground, the existing partners in a neighborhood, using the technology that people already had. So we didn't expect them to install another app. We were often training them to use things they already had on their phone and then building a training program around that. So again, using these tools they already had. This worked incredibly shockingly well and we ended up with about 250 events a week for our little ward. We're currently working on a version for this for the trans community in London called the Trans Dimension that will be launching at the start of July. So you can look out for that. But we made this with Gendered Intelligence um, who are lovely people and have been coordinating a partnership there of about 30 groups. So I'll leave you with some final thoughts. Um, as I said, we've got lottery funding to explore this idea. And we've got a little team together. Um, we'd love to find out what people are up to. Um, I will leave you with this final quote, um, which is just, which it says, the space beyond fixed and established order structures and morals is not one of disorder. It's the space of emergent orders, values and forms of life. So this is where we're getting at. We're not trying to make new structures. We're trying to enable things to form organically. And um, yeah. I, I look forward to telling everyone how we're doing this time next year. Um, yeah, we've got some info here. We've got a Discord. We've got some little flies with our info on. So um, thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm.